Welcome to today's webinar on how three major transport providers are responding to the climate change emergency. The speakers today include Stephen Hart from Network Rail, Paul Walker from Go South Coast and Liz Higgins from Bristol Airport. My name is Dawn DeBrees and I'm chair of the RCPI Southwest and I'll be hosting today's event and Alexis Edwards will be coordinating the Q&A at the end of the presentation. In respect of housekeeping and to help you get the most out of the session, I'm just going to cover a few quick points. So as delegates, you've all been muted. If you have any questions, then please raise them via the question box in the GoToWebinar panel. It may be on the right or the top of your screen. The speakers' presentations will run for approximately 50 minutes before we come to the Q&A, and we'll get to as many of you as we're able to, but any questions not answered will be considered after the session and responses will be emailed to all participants. A copy of the presentations will also be included as a handout for you to download from the GoToWebinar panel towards the end of the session. If you personally lose connection during the session, please try rejoining via the link that you've been sent from GoToWebinar. You can increase your Wi-Fi connectivity by disconnecting all other devices from Wi-Fi. If a speaker loses connectivity, then please wait in the webinar but keep an eye on your emails in case we have to relaunch the session with a new link. So now the formalities are done, I would like to introduce you to Stephen Hart, who will be presenting on decarbonating the rail industry and climate resilience. Thank you. Thanks, Dawn, that's great. And thank you uh, for inviting me along today. It's, uh, it's great to be able to come along and, and talk today around some of the work the Network Rail is doing around um, decarbonisation. So as Dawn said, um, I'm Stephen Hart, I'm a, a lead strategic planner within Network Rail System Operator Team. Um, so my, me and my team are principally responsible for um, strategic planning uh, for the freight industry. So, so we look after the rail freight sector and what needs to be done to the rail network over the next 30 years to be able to accommodate freight and freight growth. Um, freight is obviously a, a network-wide entity. We, we, we have freight trains that run everywhere on the network. Um, so as a result of that, uh, me and my team also picks up what, what's termed network strategy, which are kind of pieces of strategic work that need to be done um, across the whole network to be able to, to accommodate and support um, various different outcomes. So my role most recently has been a uh, lead strategic planner on Network Rail's Traction Decarbonisation Network Strategy. And um, so I've been specifically looking at, at how we remove diesel trains from the network across the, the wider network. Um, and I'll be talking a little bit about that today, as well as a, a number of the other aspects of Network Rail's decarbonisation work streams and climate resilience that we, we are undertaking as a wider organisation. So first, uh, I suppose the key starting point more than anything is is to paint the, the climate challenge it, it's not very often that i get to talk about this stuff because i'm normally second or third on a, on a slideshow so it was, it was a nice opportunity for me to be able to for once be able to talk around the climate challenge um so where are we what's happening what's the big issue the big issue is obviously global warming so the paris climate agreement um in 2015 saw the world's leaders collectively come together to establish a, a, a binding resolution across all countries, uh, or certainly most countries of the world anyway, to limit global average temperature rise to well below two degrees C, with an ambition to limit that rise to below 1.5 degrees C. There's been significant challenges and, and lots of hard work done since then, and, and actually most recently today, um, the, there was a, an article on BBC this morning that outlined and, and uh, showed that research suggests that um, the global commitments that are being made, most recently those by China and, and um, the forthcoming commitments by the US, are likely to, to lead us to a, a, a warming scenario of around 2.1 degrees C, so we're certainly heading in the right direction. From a, a UK perspective, um, we're obviously bound uh, to the Paris Climate Agreement and, and that was enshrined into UK law um, through an amendment to the 2008 Climate Change Act, um, which means that the UK is now legally bound to, to reduce the emissions of the wider economy to net zero greenhouse gases by 2050. That's not going to be easy. That's going to be a huge challenge. Um, it's going to be a huge challenge for the economy as a whole and it's going to require significant investment across all all aspects of the economy 
whilst sectors such as industry and, and power are beginning to decarbonise and decarbonise successfully and, and uh, emissions reductions are, are going down year on year, the picture is slightly different for transport. Transport is now the highest emitting sector of the UK economy and is responsible for around 30-35% of the overall emissions from the UK. It's going to be difficult, it's going to be a tough journey and it's going to require a lot of work. It's going to be especially tough for certain sectors such as aviation, as I'm, I'm sure we'll hear later on, um, but also areas such as shipping and, and agric uh, agriculture as well. As a result, there's there's probably going to be some emissions, residual emissions from those sectors of the economy, um, because it's going to be virtually impossible to, to fully decarbonise those sectors and there are likely to be emissions post 2050 as a well. result. Those emissions to, to get to the net zero are going to have to be offset and currently offsetting technology, both man-made and, and natural, um, means that there'll be a finite amount of emissions that can be offset and it's likely that the emissions that will be provided through aviation and agriculture are, are going to take up most, if not all, of any budget available. Um, and as a result of that, pretty much all other sectors of the economy are going to have to reach zero or certainly virtually zero by the time we get to 2050. I thought um, as a start as well, um, as well as that slight uh, context setter for, for climate change, I'd provide a slight context setter for rail as well, because I'm conscious that not everybody will necessarily be versed in the, the, the complexities that is the rail network. Um, so the rail, the railway itself is, is owned and managed by the infrastructure owner Network Rail, so, so it's the organisation I work for. And effectively, Network Rail provides the fixed assets and signalers to be able to operate the railway. So all of the track, the infrastructure that's in the ground is ours. All of the staff to maintain and upkeep that infrastructure is ours. And we also control the kind of the traffic lights on the railway, basically. Um, we also personally manage the largest 20 stations in the UK ourselves, but all of the stations away from those 20 larger stations are, are managed by uh, the train operating companies themselves. So train operations, the actual trains that run on the railway um, are run by operating companies, as I touched on. So train operating companies run passenger services, so the likes of Southwest Railway and Great Western Railway, the train operating companies, they actually operate the trains that, that you'll get on and, and, and use on the network. And there are also freight operating companies who operate the freight trains that run around on our network as well. All of those companies are private entities. Um, they have differing levels of relationship with both network rail and government based on kind of contracts that they have um, and the freight operating companies are, are operated on a completely private basis so there's no sort of uh, specifications provided by government for freight operations they are done 100 percent on a commercial basis as part of the wider logistics sector Within the rail sector itself and on the network, um, trains effectively are powered by two different systems, or we call them traction systems. Um, essentially, that's diesel, so the combustion of diesel, diesel fuel to create energy, or direct electricity from various different systems. So within the south, uh, within the southern area, we have two uh, principal systems in, in use. So you have the 750 volt DC third rail system, which is where electricity is provided on a, on a, a third rail that is provided on the ground and, and that provides electricity into the train. But also, as is the case on the wider network, uh, the wider UK network, we have 25,000 volt AC electrification uh, overhead line, uh, where electricity is provided in, a, in a, a wire that hangs above the railway effectively to provide electricity to trains. From a service split perspective, um, whilst passenger services are, are, are generally a good balance between electric and diesel, um, with a slight favor, favoritism towards electric services for passenger services, um, with freight, um, the vast majority of freight operations are, are diesel and, and operated by diesel trains. Um, so within rail and, and within the rail sector, combining the, the kind of the picture that I've provided of rail there and, and the wider kind of emissions challenge and, and, and the challenge around uh, achieving net zero, rail in itself is, a, is already a very green mode of transport. So, so rail contributes less than 1% of the UK's overall greenhouse gas emissions and, and less than 2% of the emissions from transport. The transport sector, which as I touched on earlier on, is now the highest emitting sector of the economy. 
within rail um, emissions principally come from two main areas so as i touched on earlier on we have uh, a lot of systems out there on the on the tracks so things like uh, signals or the traffic lights that are on the railway and the various power to, to various systems that, that provides power to those as well as other equipment that we use to run the railway and um, we typically call that non-traction electricity electricity and that covers a, a vast range of a, a vast array of stuff and, and the emissions that come from those are, are obviously uh, uh, the electricity that uses those are, are included as, as part of our wider emissions as well as that we have direct traction emissions so that's the emissions that come directly from from trains as a result of principally burning diesel fuel for a number of years now um, the electricity that we use to, to feed trains and, and operate trains has been balanced against units of uh, nuclear power through a power purchasing agreement that we have um, so that the emissions that come from from the rail sector um, from traction are, are, are almost exclusively from from diesel trains and as we touched on earlier on that that's both passenger diesel trains and freight diesel trains um, so most of our non-traction emissions, so the, the stuff that doesn't come from trains, um, is, is principally, as I say, from, from the infrastructure that we use to, to, to operate the network, such as things like signals and, and the electric systems that feed points that allow trains to move between tracks, um, as well as from the stations themselves. Um, and also the, the various network rail operations that go on to, to be able to operate and maintain and upkeep the railway. We have a number of offices located all around the country um, as we run the entire network in, the, uh, in, in, in Great Britain. As well as that, um, in order to maintain and, and upkeep the railway, we, we have a number of uh, road vehicles as well. That help us to support to do that we have a, a significant road fleet of several thousand vehicles that we use to to keep and upkeep the railway and, and uh, help our staff get around to to be able to ensure that the railway continually operates and we obviously have direct emissions from from those vehicles as a result as well so focusing for a second on 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 my skilled area which is traction decarbonization and removing diesel trains as I touched on as part of my introduction, Network Rail has recently undertaken a piece of work called the Traction Decarbonisation Network Strategy, um, which has been done on behalf of the wider rail industry to determine how we remove diesel trains from the network. Essentially, we're proposing doing that by deploying more electric trains and also introducing hydrogen and battery powered trains into the network in order to be able to remove diesel entirely. Different, um, different trains and different traction types have different capabilities. As you can see by the diagram on the right hand side, the, for services that operate over, passenger services that operate over 100 miles an hour and for freight services, the only credible traction alternative to diesel is electrification basically and, and provision of direct electricity. Um, the reason behind that is that um, Travelling at very high speeds or pulling really heavy loads as freight trains do requires a lot of energy and um, both batteries and hydrogen have relatively poor energy density compared to, to diesel essentially um, uh, and as a result you need a lot of batteries and a lot of hydrogen to be able to create the same sort of volumes of energy that's required for freight operations. And that becomes unpalatable to, to the train operations themselves because you need several vehicles of, of power effectively um, to be able to, to provide that. And that limits the amount of, uh, sort of speed that you can go as a result of the weight that you're carrying or as a result of the kind of length, the restricted length that you can have of the train. You, you end up losing kind of wagons off a freight train to be able to provide power wagons. And that's unpalatable and uncommercial from, a, um, from an operations perspective. So the only solution is electrification and, and providing direct electricity to the network. Um, within the network, we, we refer to single track kilometres when it comes to electrification. Effectively, what that is, is one kilometre of two of a two, of two track railway, so a railway in either direction, um, is effectively two single track kilometres. So it's just measuring everything in, in a single length, basically. Um, from a network wide perspective, there are around about 15,500 single track kilometres of, of unelectrified railway on, on the GB network. 
Um, and as a result of the analysis that we've undertaken as part of Traction Decarb, we've re recommended a significant volume of that needs electrifying um, to be able to provide uh, electricity to, to freight and long distance high speed services principally. Um, as well as that, we've also recommended a number of areas where battery and hydrogen traction is more suited and would be able to support um, passenger operations to be able to remove diesel trains from the light network. So as I touched on earlier, um, we also have our non-traction emissions and, and there are a number of areas to consider around those as well. Um, at around about the same time that the Traction Decarbonisation Network Strategy was published on the Network Rail website, we also released our wider environmental sustainability strategy that's outlined as well as the work that we're doing as part of Traction Decarb, the work that we need to do for our non-traction emissions as well and our focus on um, climate change and climate change adaptation. So I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes talking around that. Um, our non-traction emissions principally surround four key areas. Um, the whole life and, and uh, the whole life carbon that, that is embodied as part of our infrastructure and infrastructure delivery and enhancements process. So that's kind of the, the, the carbon that's based in concrete and steel that we use to be able to, to operate and, and maintain and upkeep the network um, and focusing on driving that down to as low as possible in conjunction with the wider construction industry. Ensuring that we're reducing emissions throughout the supply chain and making sure that um, procurement processes within network rail take a, a, a carbon focused approach as opposed to a cost focused approach and ensuring that we're, we're driving the right behaviours within the supply chain that we use to both run and uh, maintain and upkeep the railway. As I touched on earlier, we have a significant road fleet and we need to begin to understand and, and uh, determine how we can provide um, electric charging uh, for, for our ultra low emissions vehicles and as, we're, as we do that we're obviously beginning to transition towards an ultra low emissions fleet vehicle fleet as well. As well as that we're using a lot of our sites and a lot of our areas to begin to create our own renewable energy to, to feed the traction system and in a similar vein to how we do with traction through power purchase agreements we're exploring and beginning to, to move towards 100% renewable, renewable energy for all of our non-traction activities as well. I just want to touch quickly and briefly on, on climate change and, and climate resilience because obviously we're, we're supporting and, and decarbonising the railway to support climate change but obviously we, we have a, a fixed asset that is at risk from changes to our climate and, and how the climate behaves. So the weather and climate are changing as, as a result of climate change and, and, and what's happening and that's having a profound impact on the network in a number of ways through uh, examples of increased flooding, um, tree fall as a, as a result of higher winds and stronger winds and greater storms. Increased heat also causes stress management on our rails so as you can see on the bottom right hand side there it can cause rail tracks to buckle because they're, they're under extreme sort of pressure and stress as they are and heat obviously causes that to, uh, causes that an issue and then as you can see in the very background there challenges such as the issues that happened in Dawlish a few years ago um, just show how resilient uh, how at risk the network is to, to wider um, climate change. We've had weather resilience and climate change adaptation strategies in place across our business since uh, 2017 now and we're now beginning to make um, progress on making our network more resilient key things such as the Southwest Resilient Programme in, in Dawlish and the wider um, Dawlish to Tainmouth area um, are providing a, a resilient solution in that, uh, in that specific area and there are a number of other examples around the country um, where we're starting to implement projects to support and make our network more resilient to the changing weather that we're facing. The key thing for, for us has been as part of those programmes is ensuring that we're focusing on the plans that we um, retain as much operational performance and we can keep the railway running for passengers and freight even in extreme weather conditions and that's been a principal driver of a lot of the work that's going on around the kind of network resilience and climate resilience work that we're doing. We're moving away from replacing things on a like-for-like -like basis, especially in those areas that are in the highest risk areas. Um, and we're doing more of a light, uh, replacing like with better. So ensuring that we're improving the, the solutions that we're providing across the infrastructure to ensure that it's resilient as we move forward with climate forecasting and, and the various different weathers. 
the recent tragic events that, that happened in Scotland with, with the derailment up there and, and the, uh, the, sad, the sad fatalities that, that occurred as a result of that showed just how at risk the railway is from climate change and, and how big the challenges that we, we have to face within the rail sector. And we need to continue to ensure that we're working as part of weather forecasting, climate resilience work and working closely with our asset renewals and our asset renewal teams as well as our continuous monitoring teams and um, to making sure that we're building in kind of the weather projections and, and we're mapping those challenges um, and identifying the areas of the network that are more susceptible to change and making sure that we're making those areas more resilient so we can avoid uh, incidents such as the one that happened in Scotland from occurring again. So that's a quick a quick run through and a quick summary of the um, of, of what we're doing in rail and, and some of the key key areas of focus in there. Um, I'll encourage you to to drop questions into the the question box at that stage, and we'll pick those all up later. And I'll pass back to Dawn, who will uh, take us through the rest of the session with you. Lovely. Thanks, Dawn. Thank you, Stephen. I think 30 to 35 percent emissions from transport clearly sets out a significant challenge for this sector, and it's it's good to see the traction decarbonisation strategy and process. Um, I'll now pass to Paul Walker, who will be presenting on building buses into new development. So if I can pass to you, Paul. Good morning. Thank you very much, Dawn. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Paul Walker. and I'm the head of strategic development for Go South Coast. I'll tell you a little bit more about Go South Coast in a minute, but just to let you know that um, for my sins, I'm a chartered town planner. I try to hide it. Um, but uh, I've uh, had about uh, 20 years local government experience in planning policy, transport and highways, uh, culminating in head of service and about four years ago we joined Go South Coast. What I'm going to do today is uh, go through some of the areas in terms of how we would like to see um, decarbonisation in new developments. Um, I'll touch briefly on, on a little bit about what we're doing, but the main focus will be about making development accessible for bus services. Like I say, uh, we're part of Go South Coast. Uh, well, I'm Go South Coast, part of the Go Ahead group. Um, in a southwest context, we operate in Bournemouth and Pool, Dorset as uh, Damry, uh, Wiltshire as Salisbury Reds and Swindon Bus. Our operation does spread slightly further east into, into Southampton, Hampshire and, and the Isle of Wight. We also operate um, contracts for two universities at Bournemouth and Southampton. I should just, um, in the context, just outline that I suppose the majority of local public transport services are made by bus in the UK. Um, Stephen referred to about 1% of carbon emissions coming from rail. About 4% of roadside pollution comes from bus services. Um, the diagram, the map that you can see here, really looks at the journeys per head um, over the last year or so. Um, and in a southwest context, you can see that um, areas like Bournemouth and Poole, Tall Bay, um, Plymouth, uh, North Somerset and Bristol see um, fairly high levels of, of public transport use. Somerset um, is one of the five local authorities with the lowest transport use in the UK. Overall, those figures have gone down by about 5% over the last year in terms of overall ridership. Only a few weeks of that really been affected by COVID. Um, it's something we don't necessarily see within Go South Coast. We see ridership and patronage increasing year on year before, before March of this year. We are doing our bit to try and help in terms of decarbonisation. Go ahead as a group are the largest group of a uh, largest uh, bus operator of electric buses. We've only got three within um, provincial businesses. Those three are actually based within within ourselves um, at Salisbury operating uh, Park and Ride. And they're really there to try and uh, get a learning experience of electric vehicles. And that's been delivered in partnership with Wiltshire Council and with the DFT. Um, they're very environmentally friendly, they're very good passengers like them and it's something we're looking at, at rolling out. We have put a bid in quite recently for the uh, Electric Towns bid for Swindon, unfortunately that wasn't successful. The Electric Towns bid, uh, Electric Bus bid, just out of interest for anybody, the two towns that have been selected to go forward are cities, <laughs> Oxford and Coventry. So before um, I start really my main presentation, we've got a small poll for you to uh, participate in, which I think should come up on the screen around about now. And developer contributions um, over the recent years have increased from about five to six billion pounds. But would you say that transport contributions have gone up by about 30 percent, down by 30 percent, 
um, up by 70%, down by 70%, or pretty much stayed the same. If you can vote now. Okay, so that's interesting. So um, nobody thinks they've gone up by 70%, so they're obviously a bunch of realists. 25% uh, um, say up by 30%. Majority saying they've probably gone down or, or stayed the same. Okay, that's interesting. Thank you for that. We'll we'll come to that in just a just a second. Um, there are quite a few images of buses on this presentation, for which I apologise, but we are a bus operator, so I guess we're kind of allowed. Um, what we do do is try to in, try to work um, with the development industry to make sure the development is accessible for buses, um, and we've done that principally through two main um, modes recently. So, firstly, through the Chartered Institute of Highways and Transport and the publication that you can see there on the right-hand side, and for working with Transport for New Homes and Foundation for Integrated Transport and the campaign campaign for better transport uh, in terms of looking at how, how new developments are made and uh, how they're accessed. None of this is actually rocket science, really, when you think about it, but the, the CIHT guidance really points developers and planners to try to ensure development for buses is something that makes it easier for buses to get to and to get through. So the bottom right hand map there you can see is the main the main sort of distributor road through development there is wide enough for a bus to get through. It means that a bus can travel straight through the heart of development, closer to higher density development, uh, higher, closer to district centres. And it means that buses aren't aren't going down to a running head and straight back up again, which is called double running, which just increases journey time and doesn't really increase any kind of patronage or modal shift. What we also do within that document is, is outline how development needs to be designed well so that buses can actually fit well and integrate to other modes. So the diagram towards the top of that screen, you can see it's basically just decent site and highway layout, pedestrian crossings, multimodal interchange, etc. Many developers and uh, Planners will talk to you about the 400 metre DFT guide from um, probably back just after PPG 13, I guess. And what this document does is take that forward into saying actually you can have um, developments further away from a bus route if it's high frequency of sort of seven or eight minutes. People will walk further to tr access services that are more frequent. Obviously, that 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 distance reduces when you get to more rural and lower frequency services. In terms of the um, Transport for New Homes initiative, which received quite a lot of publicity actually when it came out about two, two and a half years ago, um, really for us concentrates on three main areas. The first really is that the resource within local authorities has reduced partly through to austerity. The, the, um, the, the transport planning resource in local authorities is, is sometimes on statutory, it's, it's, it's not there, people retire, people move on, and there's not that expertise within house. Um, we, we do find that a lot of time that um, planners generally just look at a self-contained site in terms of red line of a planning application and don't really consider the, the relationship of the development to, to the, the wider hinterland. And also the, uh, one of the uh, recommendations of the study is that bus operators like Network Rail and like how East England should be statutory consultees. We are after all guardians of, of the network. Um, what was once Wilson Dorset is currently more and will be something else in the future. I asked you about that that in that uh, developer contribution question, and and actually within the last um, 15 years or so, developer contributions have gone up, but the amount of money that's gone towards transport and travel has actually declined by about 70%. And the reason we find for that is that uh, a lot of that money has been um, diverted into healthcare and education as a result of austerity, and that transport really is a, is a poor is a poor relation. We do also realise that making development accessible to buses actually has a cost for the developer so this example on the right in the in the sort of beige box is from swindon where to extend a, a carriageway by about a meter is around about 500 pound per square meter and in this particular development of five five thousand dwellings around about four and a half million pounds so we do appreciate there is a cost to making developments accessible by buses I suppose the main points we'd, we'd make in terms of trying to make development accessible for buses and other sustainable forms of transport really is that um, sites need to be on existing high quality corridors. We do find, um, to take a case outside of the region in Oxfordshire, where 
uh, housing allocation sites are dumped on airfields in the middle of nowhere in completely unsustainable locations. Um, and it's better for us to connect interurban services to new developments, um, as well as um, extension of existing bus services to sites on the edge of urban developments. Diversion is undesirable, but we do do that. Enhancement is ideal. One of the things we're talking about uh, more locally in, in Bournemouth and Poole, um, some developments are actually about locate, improving frequency in evenings and Sundays to enable that development to become more modally less reliant on the car. Large scale sites um, do cause problems for us in terms of bus services because they take a long time to come forward in terms of those urban extensions and there's how is that critical mass actually assembled and I'll come on to that in just a moment. Um, smaller developments on the edge of existing areas are better for us because that means we simply extend services and that makes the overall offer more viable. Um, sometimes we are involved um, very late in the process um, and we find that planners and, and others generally find that um, the, the importance of the bus is overlooked and we, we're often called into retrofit schemes, which is, is not a lot of good starting point. And it's generally obviously easier to have us in at the start and to use bus operators as a resource to enable more sustainable development. In terms of urban extensions, I guess there's a difference between what the theory and, and practice is. Often they're seen as, oh, comprehensive approach to to improving overall um, sustainable transport modes but problem we find of that is they generally it's hard to fit them in with existing um, communities they're bolted on at the end they're, they're very big and they take a long time to come forward they often take 10 years or so to build out so at what point do you start a bus service at what point um, can you actually gain access um, and who pays to maintain that service over a period of time and over what period of time can it actually become reasonably viable commercially um, and often it's very hard to get a bus in due to those phasing and, and trying to uh, sometimes sites come forward in quite a piecemeal way. Um, we do feel they can, well, the theory is that they, there's a there's a theory they can deliver a critical mass of demand for high quality bus services, but we don't know if necessarily that ex demand is actually expressed within a single logical corridor. So, for example, some housing allocations on the north edge of Poole um, traditionally look towards Poole, but also look towards Bournemouth, uh, Southampton and, and London. And how is how is that dealt with in terms of public transport solution? And and the idea of, of these are essentially is they're, they're better able to fund lumpy investment um, that can help meet the needs of bus services. But, but what we generally find is that they get saddled with lots of additional costs in terms of new roundabouts, bridges, um, lots of shiny, bright new things. And bus has really just become a, become a nice to have as opposed to, to something that's got a big ribbon that can be cut by the politicians. So our key themes for that really, that Development needs to be a heart, uh, transport needs to be a heart of development. Bus operators, we obviously would feel would be statutory consultees because we're the guardians of the asset. A development needs to be in accessible locations and we do need to look behind the red line of, of planning applications. In terms of design and making buses part of new development, uh, I'm going to use a document here from uh, our, our colleagues, friends and competitors at Stagecoach. Some of you may know uh, my opposite number at Stagecoach, who's a chap called Nick Small, who at the same time we were developing the CIHT guidance on which Nick was involved and developed their own guide, um, which is um, reproduced here. And I've reproduced the, the, the front cover and some of the pictures from Nick's, guy, Nick's guidance for, for three reasons. First, because they really demonstrate the point really well. Secondly, none of us have been getting out as much as we otherwise would have been. And, and thirdly, Nick's, um, Nick's um, document won an award, which um, the CIHT didn't. So um, with thanks to Nick and with his approval, I'm gonna show you these few pictures. Um, this is an example of car dependent development. You can see here the road's quite narrow, there's lots of parking, no parking restrictions. It's hard for a bus to get up there. This is the middle of the day. Imagine that if there's a bit of double parking, verge parking at night time and, and it's simply impenetrable by bus services. We do try to make sure that buses can fit into developments and that's when you need to involve bus operators fairly early. The impact then is that we can get access into developments, we can improve modal shift, we can add to the carbon decarbonisation agenda. Um, we need to have development that centres around bus stops and services. It needs to connect to pedestrian cycle connectivity. It needs to um, put buses at the centre of different modal interchange points. Um, and we also need 
those bus services to be simple and direct. Now, as uh, as a bus operator, sometimes we make it difficult for ourselves in terms of making things simple and direct, but that is a general principle that we should be aiming for. And this is an example of, of more bus friendly development with a wider road, parking restrictions. You can see we've got a triple yellow line there. So still not perfect, but we, we're getting there and actually enables bus access pretty much 24 seven and, and, and good progress and a pro, a good progress for the bus. As I say, sometimes um, we, we're seen as an afterthought and this is a classic example here. Um, not an easy bus stop to get onto because of parking. There's no drop curb, uh, raise curb rather. Um, there's no waiting facilities. It's hard for that bus driver to get onto the site, hard to get off again. And it's not going to be easy for those guys trying to get that buggy onto the onto the bus. The main themes then really for us in terms of urban design uh, is that development needs to be uh, located to maximise the use of a sustainable modes and, and minimise car dependency, which will have a, a, a benefit uh, decarbonising approach. Urban design needs to maximise the relevance and effectiveness of public transport. Um, there's really a lack of clarity at the minute on, on, on how sustainable transport choices are, are, are taken in terms of plan making development management if you look at any planning application um, report that goes to any any committee um, transport is really very much left towards the end of that of that report which is quite odd because that's the the, the impact that has on most people on that development um, and also what we're finding is that that funding is obviously falling um, and therefore there's a need to lever, lever in and those commercial bus services um, is even more vital and so there's an even bigger reason to to get bus operators involved. I should say we, we, we can talk to you about um, different types of vehicle technology um, and all the rest of it which are more than happy to do so. People see diesel as a bad thing, it's not necessarily a bad thing. Clean diesel 5, clean diesel 6 is, is a lot better than your traditional car. Um, a brand new Euro 6 bus, for example, in diesel term is is less than hot, is is about 10 percent, uh, 90 percent more efficient than than a brand new Volkswagen Golf. So so don't see diesel as necessarily a bad thing when it comes to, to brand new buses. But we are working on other solutions, which I can happily talk to you about another time. Um, my final slide really is is looking at uh, the government white paper and a response that was put together by ourselves as Go Ahead Group, Stagecoach, and also um, First Group. Um, a 65 page response to the planning white paper for all three of the five big bus operators in, in the UK. I guess the main points we pull out of that is there's no real um, idea of how we would engage or how the public engage with the planning process other than through the local plan. Um, that we see developer contributions abolished and replaced by a national development value tax, but we don't see how that is then reinvested into the communities which are impacted by new development. There's no impact, there's no comment at all about transport considerations in the white paper. And it's also clear how we can steer development towards high quality public transport. The paper also really looks at um, development management decisions that are primarily about what the development looks like and not actually about how developments function. And we think that's a really important element that needs to be considered as we as that white paper develops. And that's it for me. Thank you very much for your time. Back to Dawn. Thank you very much, Paul. It, it was really good to understand the associated policy guidance and the challenges of funding transport through applications. Um, I'm now handing over to Liz Higgins for a presentation on making Bristol Airport carbon neutral by 2025. Thank you, Liz. Thanks, Dawn. Um, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for the invitation to talk today on how at Bristol Airport we're working towards an ambitious target of becoming carbon neutral for our direct emissions by 2025 and becoming net zero by 2050. So just by way of introductions, um, my name is Liz Higgins and I'm the planning manager at Bristol Airport. I'm part of the sustainability and corporate affairs team. So as you can guess from my title, I work on all things planning related. So also in my team, I have two colleagues who are focused on the sustainability agenda and we work very closely together. So in this presentation, I'm going to set out a bit of planning background um, and then move on to discussing our carbon roadmap and what is entailed to achieve our sustainability ambitions. 
planning and sustainability, as you know, are intrinsically linked and arguably one cannot be achieved without the other. So you can see from this chart um, airport growth up to 2019. However, the aviation industry, we've been particularly affected by the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. So prior to 2020, the airport experienced year-on-year -year growth, and in 2019, we handled approximately 9 million passengers. And we are expecting to reach 10 million passengers by 2021. But this year has been unprecedented, and our passenger numbers have significantly decreased as a result of the pandemic. So you'll see where we were thinking we were getting to get to in 2020, but unfortunately numbers are way below what we would normally be doing. But with the hopes of a vaccine and improved testing, we are planning for numbers to start to climb again in 2021. And I'll come on to later how passenger volumes this year are impacting on our planning strategy at the airport. <clears throat> so before I go on to the next slide, which talks about growth, I just wanted to set out where we're at at the moment. So back in 2011, the airport was granted planning permission by North Somerset Council to grow to 10 million passengers per annum. So along with the increase in uh, passengers that plan permission also included infrastructure such as um, new terminal extensions, additional aircraft stands, highway improvements, car parking, a hotel as well as other development and we've also progressed developments through our permitted development rights which as an airport we benefit from so that included development such as our new office building aircraft stands, aircraft hangars and car parking. And with passenger numbers growing, back in 2017, the airport prepared a draft master plan, which was subject to extensive public consultation. And by 2018, with 10 million projected in 2021, it became clear that we need to submit a planning application to grow beyond 10 million passengers per annum. So in December 2018, we submitted a planning application to grow passenger numbers to 12 million per year. We proposed infrastructure development comprising of a terminal extension, passenger walkways, a new multi-storey car park, some surface level car parking, highway improvements out on the A38, as well as a new internal road layout. And in February this year, the planning application was taken to committee with an officer recommendation for approval. But unfortunately, it was subsequently refused by the planning committee. So in response, we submitted a planning appeal to the inspectorate back in September this year. And we're expecting a public inquiry to take place next summer. So as part of the appeal, we are in the process of undertaking updated passenger forecasts, and these will take into account the impact of the pandemic. We expect there to be a delay in when we reach 10 million passengers. So previously, as I mentioned, we thought that would be around 2021. It's now looking like it's going to be around 2024. But it is very clear from the work that we've done that there is a need um, for growth up to 12 million. So intrinsic to our future growth is how the airport addresses the climate emergency challenge. As already has been discussed, climate change is the greatest challenge of our time. Keeping temperature change within one and a half degrees by the end of the century will require significant changes to our society, including the way that we travel. And at Bristol Airport, we're responding to this challenge by reviewing every aspect of the way that we do business. So we've already taken steps towards a low carbon future. And back in 2019, we produced our carbon roadmap. This is all available on our website should you want to take a look afterwards. 
and then sets out how we achieve our ambition to be a net zero airport by 2050 and becoming carbon neutral for our direct emissions by 2025. So Bristol Airport's carbon footprint includes all scope one, so directly generated, and scope two, indirectly generated emissions. This includes all infrastructure and vehicles under the airport's direct control. So that's the sort of terminal areas, our offices and workshops, and all of our fleet vehicles as well. So that's the internal car park buses, the airside operations vehicles, and our fire vehicles as well. So the graphs here shows progress that we've made, and this is particularly notable on the second graph, which looks at progress on CO2 per passenger. So as you can see, there was a reduction in CO2 per passenger on scope one and scope two of 37% in 2018 when compared against 2014. And these savings have been driven with our building management system optimization, um, installation of further renewables in our offices and further energy efficient equipment being installed. In 2019, we switched over to a renewable energy supply from a green tariff, and we also introduced more carbon, uh, sorry, more electrical charging points for customers. So how do we measure our performance? Well, we use the Airport Carbon Accreditation Scheme, or ACAS. It's the only institutionally endorsed global carbon management certification programme for airports. And it independently, independently assesses and recognises the efforts of airports to manage and reduce their carbon emissions. And it has four levels of certification. So we're currently at level two due to our emissions reduction performance since 2014, and we're aiming for level three. I thought it's important to touch on scope three emissions. So these are emissions that are outside of the direct control of Bristol Airport, but obviously it's still extremely important. Um, so firstly, surface access. And we have begun to make considerable inroads on this uh, scope three emissions. So back in January this year, we became the first airport in Europe to offset all passenger journeys to and from the airport by road. And the offsets will be purchased retrospectively based on an annual passenger survey, which shows the different modes of travel used by passengers. And the Environmental Effects Working Group, which is through our airport's consultative committee. So this is um, a committee in which local communities and airport users are represented. They will play a role in selecting suitable offsetting schemes with a focus on local projects where at all possible. And now on to aviation emissions. So this is again scope three and whilst outside of the direct control of Bristol Airport, it is obviously important that we recognise the role that airlines are taking in reducing and offsetting carbon emissions. In November 2019, EasyJet, and they operate more than 50% of flights to and from Bristol Airport, they became the first major airline to offset carbon emissions from fuel used by its aircraft. And since 2000, EasyJet have reduced their carbon emissions by over a third. They've introduced new aircraft, so they introduced the A320neo back in 2017. And in 2019, they took their first delivery of the A321neo. And this is their largest, quietest, most cost efficient and most eco-friendly aircraft yet. And Bristol Airport, we're very lucky that we've got um, a number of A320s um, operating. But there are other measures that airlines are taking. So again, back to EasyJet, they are looking at filling each flight so that they're efficient. So back in 2019, their load factor was around 92.9%, which is, which is really high. And where possible, they'll use only one engine when taxiing on the ground. And airlines also use climb, descent and landing techniques, which improve efficiencies. 
And this year also sees the start of the Carbon Offsetting Reduction Scheme for International Aviation, known as Corsia. And this is a global agreement to stabilise net carbon emissions from flights at 2020 levels. So back to what we're doing at Bristol Airport. So these are the sort of things that we're doing to become both carbon neutral by 25 and looking ahead to be net zero by 2050. I'll just touch on um, a couple of these. So for example, um, how people get to the airport is really important. And what we're trying to do is reduce down the what we call kiss and fly. Um, so that's basically people that drop off um, friends and family at the airport. And the reason being is that actually um, includes four trips to and from the airport. So we've set out sort of a hierarchy with that at the bottom. And then above that is people that would drive and park because that's two trips. But obviously the most sustainable would be to use public transport. Um, other measures include changing our staff travel habits, which is quite challenging at Bristol Airport because of where we're located. Um, and again, so that comes to improving public transport, but the challenge also comes from those operational staff that do shift patterns. So they could be working through the night where bus services might not necessarily be operating at a frequency that would um, make it work. So as well as public transport, things like car sharing is, is really important. More electrical vehicle charging points is, is obviously key. Um, and how we build new development. So really important when we're developing new buildings that they're efficient and that we minimise any heat loss, for example. And this is our carbon reduction journey. So this is how we intend to get to net zero airport by 2050. So I've mentioned we've already done some things. So that was back in 2019. And then 2020, we're looking to become level three um, accredited. We have already offset all our emissions for passenger journeys to and from the airport. And this year starts the, uh, the baseline for um, net carbon emissions under Corsia. And I've included this slide because I just think it's it's quite in a useful slide really to show that you know progress has been made and this compares 2008 against um, 2018. And one of the important ones here to note. So passenger numbers grew quite substantially, 6.3 million to 8.6 million. Um, but you can see aircraft movements didn't grow that much relatively. Um, and that's due to, we mentioned with EasyJet and other airlines, is the average load is increasing. So we're getting more passengers on planes. Um, so back in 2008, the average was 105 and now it's 131. Um, I think else, elsewhere on this slide, some important points is the public transport. So back in 2008, um, this was looking at modal share by, by public transport and that was 7.7%. It's got the 2018 figure, but actually 2019, it was up to 13.8%. So we are making progress, um, but there is there's more to be more to be done on, on public transport as well. Um, and I think also worth looking at there is how much waste we're recycling and our waste to landfill, which as you can see is substantially um, decreased. So that's it from me. Um, I hope that was useful and I look forward to some questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you very much, Liz. I think the impact on the pandemic on this sector is, is clear and it's good to see the progress on the carbon roadmap. Um, I'll now hand over to Alexis to coordinate the Q&A session. Thank you, Alexis. Thank you, Dawn. Um, right, I've got a question here for Stephen. Is a national high speed network the best way to decarbonise um, by reducing car and air travel? Or is it better to invest in upgrades, local improvements, and full electrification? 
That's a that's a really interesting question and 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 one one that we get asked quite a lot. I, I think the key thing really is it it's probably both really. So so the rail network has has a lot to offer in terms of being able to support through modal shift away from from road vehicles and from aviation um, to be able to support especially domestic journeys um, in the UK through through improved rail connectivity and and to do that especially to compete with with aviation and to support modal shift uh, towards rail from that you have to have comparable journey times and to be able to achieve that you need um, the likes of HS2 to be able to to provide that as well as other high speed networks. We absolutely need to to continue to support and and um, invest in you know current infrastructure as well. Um, just because you, we're providing HS2 doesn't mean that the conventional network is going to get any quieter. Um, one of the main reasons why HS2 is being built is not to increase journey time, uh, not to not to decrease journey time between Birmingham and London or Manchester and London. It's actually to be able to provide opportunities to run more freight trains on the West Coast mainline, which is already absolutely rammed full, basically. Um, so there, there is a need to, to be able to provide that and continue to support and invest in, in, in both, I would suggest. So I don't think it's a... I don't think it's an either or. I think it's a, we need both to be able to achieve that successfully and support the wider service transport uh, sector as we decarbonise through through modal shift to rail. Yeah, thank you, Stephen. Um, Paul, slightly different question here. Are you able to provide any evidence that electric buses will broaden the appeal of bus use? Um, as I said in our presentation it, it's fairly early days for us in the Salisbury experience what we have found in London on the Red Arrow services that go between Waterloo and Victoria is that people prefer prefer the ride it's a smoother ride it's a more gentle ride it's less it's less kind of jerky if you like um, and people do do prefer that but that's that's part of the reason why we've we've got it in terms of passenger experience in terms of trying to find out how it actually works in the Salisbury context and then the idea would be then to, to roll out across the rest of the fleet Um, sorry to press you on that, Paul, but are there particular detailed examples or, or studies on on this? No, no, not that we've not that we've got. We that's the that's the reason why we've got the three in Salisbury, so that we can actually do an assessment on on what the quantitative uh, quantitative view of qualitative view rather is of of, of, of customers. Um, and the idea um, was that we would we would do some surveys and try and assess how people actually what their views of the new buses were. Obviously, we're in a situation where we're not in a in a situation where we can do that at the moment. So we'll do that uh, as we as we as we sort of exit recovery, if you like, um, and then we'll get some feel for for how, what the passenger experience is. We just haven't had the, the ability to do that just yet. OK, thank you, Paul. Uh, Liz, there's been a lot of scepticism about carbon offsetting. Are you able to give more information on how the airport is, is going to achieve this? Um, well, it's it is all set out on on our website that we were looking to partner with um, a company that would help us with with offsetting. And I mentioned before that we're looking to um, sort of govern that through our consultative committee as well as to how that offsetting is undertaken with ideally local projects. But I think there is I understand there is. Um, there is skepticism out there and especially more so probably on the aviation emissions side um but i think we have to do what we can on offsetting and especially on aviation until we the sort of technology becomes available that we're actually more on the the carbon reduction side okay thank you for that stephen how are network rail going to approach delivering the traction decarbonisation strategy? Is it going to be an annual rolling programme or are you looking at having standalone big ticket investments? So, so give, given the kind of volume of, of uh, particularly electrification infrastructure that we've recommended on a network wide level, um, that's obviously a significant investment and, and will require a significant investment from government to be able to, to enhance the network and, and provide the volumes that we're providing. 
equally one of the key things though is that um if we're going to deliver a sustainable sort of program that, that can deliver the the sorts of volumes of electrification that we've talked around there um it's going to be a long-term program it will need to be at least kind of 30 years long to be able to deliver that given the the abilities of the, the supply chain to be able to deliver that we can't afford to to kind of have the the boom and bust cycles that we've seen in in previous decades around electrification in the rail network and we need to ensure that um we have that longer term sustainable um program that can can give the supply chain volume and comfort to be able to to develop and, and deliver their staff i think in terms of how it's specifically going to be delivered uh, i think what you'll what we'll be seeing over the next few years is is a number of um themes and projects entering into into the investment process in in the rail industry that will provide um specifically provide electrification um for, for areas of the network and, and provide that as a, as a solution to, to offer uh, not just decarbonisation but also passenger and freight benefits um but i think we'll also begin to see a number of bigger programs of work where there's line of route upgrades undertaken um to, to to be able to kind of enhance and improve the wider network in conjunction with delivery of electrification and um, so that kind of multiple benefits can be benefit streams can be delivered with as little disruption to passenger and freight and user as possible thank you Stephen. Uh, liz the government's 10-point plan favors sustainable aviation fuels are there any studies to what this means for airfares and the attractiveness of flying? Oh, good question. Um, it's probably more one for one of my sustainability co colleagues at the airport. Um, I don't know of any studies, and I think it's probably good to go on um, to look through Corsia, so to go on to, to their website as well, because They've got loads of information on there, as well as um, you can watch quite a few of their their presentations. Um, but yeah, I'm afraid I can't answer that one at this at this point. Thank you. Um, on a similar vein, um, as you progress to net zero by 2050, obviously aviation fuel is one part of how you're going to achieve that. Is the, the airport itself going to encourage um, the use of e-planes by, for example, adjusting landing fees to attract that kind of fueling type? Mm, well, I think firstly, when we're looking at Bristol Airport is looking at more the scope one and two. So that doesn't include um, the aviation emissions. They're, they are scope three. So whilst we you know, we'll look to work with airlines that's not within our um, our carbon roadmap specifically. Um, we're lucky we're in the southwest. We've got a fantastic technology, fantastic companies progressing um, aviation technology. So, you know, we're we're hopeful, um, and you can see headlines popping up in the news now and then about certain airlines. Um, that are quite confident that electrification will take place um so i don't see any reason why we wouldn't you know we've we've we're lucky we've got airlines such as we have so with with easyjet for example we've got the a321 neos um with ryanair um they're bringing forward the, the maxes so they are airlines are investing all the time in improved technology and we would hope that with permitted growth uh, looking forward that airlines will want to invest in their fleet at bristol airport specifically okay i've got a question here which is possibly for paul but maybe is a bit more broader than that and would touch on all of you um are, are electric vehicles really green uh, batteries require relatively scarce materials and often source from sensitive environments discuss yeah that's an interesting one um i think in terms of electric bus technology which is sadly what i know a little bit too much about than i should do um we've had a situation previously where we've had hybrid vehicles and they're still hybrid vehicles on the market but it's how long does that battery technology last for and some of the situations we've had in the past 
in some of our sister companies has been that those batteries have only lasted about four or five years and then they there's four or five batteries on the bus each battery costs quite a lot of money and also it means that what do you do with that battery once you're done with it and the battery life and the vehicle life is then negatively impacted i think what we have seen in the last few years is the battery life um, of vehicles exponentially increase and improve so actually what you can get out of that is, is more effective and what we're doing in terms of working with um, electric is looking at different ways of, of sourcing that power through battery farm technology for example rather than just taking it directly off the grid because that's what we'd probably need to do if we had 100 buses come back to the depot and like at the same time as you're cooking your tea you don't want the bus buses sort of zapping all the power out of, out of your kettle so it, it, it's 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 something that we, we're looking at but i I think electric is, is better than, than some of the hydrogen options. I've heard bad things about hydrogen, but as we've not been investing in hydrogen, I can't really speak to that because I'm, I'm not that advanced in it. But technology is improving. It is greener. We use sustainable we use sustainable modes, but it's actually the lifespan of the battery that, that really is, is important. And, and there's a similar thing, I think you, somebody mentioned about the radio and on the radio last week was something about how you know a car, a brand new a brand new electric car has to do 50,000 miles to, to 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 sort of relate itself to a, a new a new pe petrol car. So it, it's all in the round, um, but the technology is improving. But I don't have an absolute answer. I have to admit. Stephen or Liz, do you, do you want to come in on this? Uh, yeah, I, I think that there's there's huge huge challenges for all sectors of the industry, not just around batteries. The, whatever solutions that you're deploying to 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 combat decarbonisation in general I, I look at the rail electrification it uses a lot of steel and a lot of concrete and steel and concrete have a lot of embodied carbon within them as well as part of the manufacturing process etc etc batteries obviously have similar uh, similar questions around ethics embodied carbon values the need to refresh and replace batteries on a regular basis hydrogen similar use of batteries within its systems and and the, the those questions around the fuel and how the fuel is produced and then questions around how you store it and how much steel and stuff is involved in that as well so there are huge huge questions from an embodied carbon perspective around everything and i think all sectors of the economy need to work with kind of material scientists and the, the various construction supply chains to ensure that we can try and draw down the the drive down the volumes of embodied carbon as far as possible um but there is absolutely no um the the, the level of control that we have uh, around kind of emissions reduction we can control kind of point of use emissions and then i think we just need to work collaboratively across the wider industry um wider industries sorry to begin to to drive down those embodied carbon values as well but i think it's a challenge for everybody to to face as well um and i think we we need to try and combat the things that we can we can focus on and, and try and deliver within the the relevant the relevant sectors and and um that's kind of the direct point of the point of use emissions um and as technology deploys and, and and matures we'll we'll begin to see those embodied carbon values come down as well yeah, and I think with electric vehicles as well, um, there's a huge challenge to provide the infrastructure. So, for example, at the airport site, providing the, if we're looking at all electric vehicles coming to the airport and their people are, say, leaving their car for a week or two and they would need to be charged, that's an awful lot of electrical vehicle charging points that we'd need at the airport. So there's the infrastructure about how that amount of electricity um, is delivered to the site to serve that. Uh, so I think what's really important, I mentioned for us was the transport hierarchy. So yes, electric vehicles is, is definitely one part of the solution, but it's also getting more people in a car rather than one person. And that, that applies more, I guess, to our staff that access the airport. So trying to encourage car sharing wherever possible. And then obviously trying to move people on to, to public transport as much as we can. Okay. I think I'm gonna take the opportunity to ask a personal question to Paul. Um, in your in your presentation, you talked about having buses as a statutory consultee. Um, having spent part of my evening last night looking at PS1 and PS2 returns, 
are you up for the challenge of responding to 100,000 applications a year? Uh, no, we're not. Um, there's two people in the industry that do do my kind of role, so absolutely not. Um, but I suppose it sort of do you put the cart before the horse, really? Um, if you if you want if you've got a decrease in um, in the expertise in the local authorities and you've got a load of consultants that are basically flying around making their own their own transport assessments up then actually do you need a sense check on some of this and actually to creating creating good relations with local bus operators and therefore creating the case to to have people like me enroll actually then means you've you've basically got a free resource i was worried when you could ask a personal question whether you're going to complain that your bus was three minutes late yesterday because that's what i normally get you never say what you do in this role Nice, nicely answered there, Paul. Um, <laughs> well done. I think we're probably drawing to close on the questions. Unless anyone's got a last minute one they're trying to sneak in now. Oh, we, we've got a, we've got a, a bite. Um, electric town bids. Two were awarded, but how many were unsuccessful? And given the urgency, shouldn't be more or all of them be funded? Yeah, um, there was um, it's a 50 million pound bid for electric bus town, and it was it was to basically demonstrate the ability of a town to achieve an electric electric bus fleet using electric buses and also hybrids between on interurban routes. So it wasn't actually a bid to to um, it, it was really done as a as a as a test in, in terms of government funding. It was one of four government funding pots that were announced. Um, all the way back on the 23rd of February, and obviously life kind of fell apart about a month afterwards. So that that bid was eventually submitted in June. We submitted one for Swindon. We were looking at submitting ones a little bit more locally to our operation um, on the south coast, but that that never really happened. Um, Oxford, um, because of its ultra low emission zone, was chosen as was was Coventry, um, and they'll they'll go forward. Now that that there is an opportunity to to roll this out. There is absolutely no commercial case for an electric bus. There's no commercial case for a hydrogen bus. They're over twice the price. And um, we don't know how much it costs to op the revenue cost to operate them. You need to do a lot more stuff. There's more stuff that can go wrong. There's more stuff that can go right. But in terms of pure commercial case, there, there isn't a case to, for electric buses. And there's not going to be a commercial case for electric buses for quite a long time because the situation that the bus industry, like the rest of the country, is in, is one where we've seen decreased patronage, negative um, messages about public transport, when only 1.8% of clusters in France and Germany have been related to public transport and just just social distancing and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So until the bus industry can get back onto its feet, there's not going to be any ability for, to buy new vehicles, let alone electric buses that are twice the price. Um, so there is going to be a need for, for additional funding. You've got to remember, of course, that you know we have three major manufacturers of buses in the UK, all of which need orders. And if we normally we normally buy about 80 or so buses a year, so we're not an ins unsubstantial purchaser of buses, which are, are over about £200,000 a pop at uh, diesel price. So yes, there's a need to do it. Um, there needs to be a case made. There needs to be better resources in terms of electrical supply, which is a major problem for us. And the planning term, one of the major problems we have is the ability to have new depots. A lot of bus depots, as, as you'll know, Alexis, locally to, to where you are, are in um, sites that are maybe not necessarily the best place. Operationally, they work, but they're certainly not ones that could be easily transferred to electric. So local planning authorities, if they want a decarbonised fleet, need to allocate land in their local plans to bus depots because in the south and southwest, for example, the land value means that we can't really compete for, for new depot sites. And, and how, how do we get that? So there's there's a real need for, and that's one of the points we made in the in the in the planning white paper. Actually, there's a real need to to tie all of that together because one one generally does does need to the other. And we are also talking to, to to the chaps at Network Rail as well in terms of sites that they've got nearby that they perhaps don't use anymore that actually got decent electric supply, for example. Okay. Um, well, I think that's it for the question. So I'd like to pass back to Dawn. Thank you, Alexis. Um, I think the challenges that face us are clear and the impact of decarbonising um, public transport, it could be significant. But negotiating public and private interests, I think, is key to enable the reductions of emissions as intended by 2050. And I think advancements in technology seem to play their part. Our responsibility is to ensure transport is integrated into the development management process to realise the clear ban benefits. But the challenge, I think, will always be the sustainable delivery. 
I hope you enjoyed today and please feel free to join our website for other CPD opportunities. And I'd like to conclude by thanking um, Stephen, Paul and Liz for the presentations, thanking Alexis for coordinating the questions and thank you all for attending. And moving forward, I would encourage you to be brave, be bold and be brilliant. Thank you.